We're talking about the future of energy and the shift towards clean energy production and what this means for the metals. Matt Watson, founder of Precious Metals Commodity Management, LLC, joins us today. Matt, welcome to Kitco. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about the future of energy here. Currently, in the United States, according to data produced by the EIA, most of our electricity still comes from fossil fuels. So the, the top source of energy production uh, is natural gas, followed by coal, nuclear, and renewables as a, as a category, which includes solar, wind, and all that, is in last place. Now, Joe Biden, president-elect, wants to institute a carbon-neutral plan putting us on a path to carbon neutrality by 2050. Tell us a bit about that, how the industry is going to change, how the economy is going to change, how our way of life is going to change. Absolutely. Uh, so California, where I'm based, is a, a great model, uh, I think, for what Joe's vision is and where he wants to take this. Um, you know, in California, we've been off of coal for about a decade now. Uh, about 40% of the power grid in California is renewable sources, including over 9% in um, solar PV, wind, and other sources. Um, you know, the, as it relates to metals, of course, solar consumes today, it's about 115 gigawatts of new installations of solar PV globally each year and growing. Uh, that consumes about 10% of the global silver supply today. And so one of, the, one of the key first questions is, well, what's the trajectory for the solar PV market? How large do they wanna grow? And you hear some discussions with some extremely large numbers where they want to grow it by a factor of literally over a thousand X, uh, which begs the question, what are you going to do about silver? Um, there's design thrifting that occurs each year uh, that lowers that modestly, roughly about a minus 6% CAGR due to design thrifting. Uh, but it's going to be challenging on how they're going to manage and bridge that gap with silver, uh, potentially becoming constrained over time as we continue to grow globally with solar PV segment. Let's talk about the uh, PGMs now. Let's narrow it down. You were telling me offline about uh, hydrogen fuel cells. Now, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a very fascinating concept, the uh, move away from petroleum for, for vehicles. Tell us about that shift. Well, sure. And first of all, I want to start with you know, the solar. Uh, and one of the problems with solar and wind is that it does not produce energy consistently throughout the day. Uh, there's some time of day influences. Of course, solar can only be generated when the sun is up. And the, yet the evening peak demand is between the uh, 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. interval in the evenings when everybody comes home and plugs in their devices and their electric cars and everything else turns on the TV. And so that's really the impetus to where this discussion on the hydrogen economy is really evolving from, is how can we do a system of storage of energy and the thought is to generate hydrogen in vast quantities and then to use that hydrogen, much like we use natural gas, to power heavy industries and to power our transportation segment, including fuel cell vehicles. Now, on the fuel cell vehicle front, the key metal is platinum. Um, fuel cells and vehicles is, is a very well-established technology. Uh, the prices of these vehicles are coming down. Uh, the price of the hydrogen itself as a fuel is coming down and, and will continue to decline. Uh, but really the biggest concern I have is just the scarcity of platinum. The loadings today of platinum on fuel cell vehicles are about 30 times higher than what's in the catalytic converter and what's, what's in the emission control system. So again, we've got to do a, a vast amount of design thrifting, but where is the platinum going to come from long term? I would foresee looking through my crystal ball that platinum today, a fairly soft market, will be very strange starting about 2030, um, that we're going to be really challenged to develop um, enough mining to support the, you know, this hydrogen economy as a whole and the transportation sector in particular. Yeah. So stepping back a little bit, why the need to produce hydrogen? Why not just make really big industrial batteries that can store solar and wind during their offload times? and then just use it during, uh, during times when there's no sun or wind? So that's really the, the big question is the storage question of what, what technology best serves gigawatt scale storage? Uh, could we use lithium ion batteries, for example, in, in massive scale? Um, you could do that on a smaller scale, but there's just not enough of the main minerals that go into lithium batteries, namely nickel, lithium, cobalt, 
um, vanadium and the like. Uh, there's just not enough minerals and our, our, our planetary reserves just aren't big enough to do these gigawatt scale deployments of storage. There's other technologies that have been considered things. Um, there's a technology called flow batteries where you have a reservoir size chemistries that are able to hold, um, hold the charge and, and the energy. Um, there's all sorts of different technologies that have been considered, but hydrogen really is the, the best play that they've come up with. And I do agree, it is, I, I think the outlook for hydrogen driving heavy industries uh, and burning it, again, very similar to how you burn a natural gas is, is very likely. In fact, they're, they're, building, they're building power plant turbines today. Uh, Mitsubishi, Siemens, there's a few people, GE, all have power plant, gigawatt scale power plants that can run off of a hybrid mix of natural gas and or hydrogen up to a ratio of 100% hydrogen. So why not just generate the hydrogen with zero CO2 emissions, um, you know, and, and, and run heavy industries that way? I think that's, it's quite a brilliant plan. Yeah. Could you see uh, residential use for hydrogen as well on a large scale? Could the grids for residential areas be using hydrogen? Absolutely. So um, one of the big problems they get into in the discussion of the, the hydrogen economy is where to put the hydrogen, where to store the physical hydrogen. Um, you, you could store it in tanks. That presents um, a, a bit of a security risk. One discussion, I know it sounds crazy, is salt caverns where you dig holes and salt flats and um, you could store it underground. Another serious discussion that Australia, US and Germany are having is to store the hydrogen at a fairly low composition in our ex existing natural gas pipelines. Um, for example, in the US and California, we've done trials in the range of four to 6% composition. All of the household burners, your water heater, your stove top, everything can burn it. You can't even tell the difference. You can't see it, smell it. It's really indistinguishable. Ends up the pipeline, the, just the, the linear millions of miles of underground natural gas pipelines that we have already plumbed to all of our businesses and all of our residential, um, you know, can hold vast quantities of this hydrogen. So that's actually one of the best strategies they've come up with to date is to, to put it in the pipelines. And then salt caverns, like I mentioned, um, they've been in use actually for some time in, in Texas, uh, for example, uh, on the Gulf Coast. Um, in California's case, they want to build a huge renewable power plant out in Utah and use the Bonneville salt flats and literally dig caverns into the, into the salt um, that are, represent huge tanks of hydrogen that they could store the hydrogen at for periods where they need it, specifically in the evenings and those peak intervals. Yeah. Matt, how urgent is this shift from fossil fuels to renewables like hydrogen? It, it, are, we, are we on a path where we need to be doing this now? Do you subscribe to, let's say, the Hubert peak oil theory, which states that basically oil production has peaked and we're on a decline? Or do you think that fossil fuel still has another 50 years, 100 years to go and there's no real urgency here? I think there's some urgency, but I just, I, I see the dilemma again in the mineral scarcity. No matter how much motivation we have to want to push all of these clean initiatives, I think we're gonna find ourselves constrained um, with platinum in the case of transportation fuel cells. Uh, we haven't talked about it, but in generation of hydrogen, one of the technologies is um, electrolyzers using PEM fuel cells. Iridium is gonna be the scarce metal there that's gonna limit how far we can go. In lithium batteries, again, for the transportation segment, I think by the end of this decade, we're going to see tightness in the lithium market, the cobalt market, the nickel market, vanadium, all the primary metals that go into the batteries of today. I think it's very likely that we're going to hit some mining constraints and really be pressed for additional mining capacity. Lithium, iridium, vanadium, where are these mined typically? Who controls the market? Good question. So in the case of, of nickel, um, about 25% of the global reserves are in Indonesia, on the Indonesian uh, island chain. Um, a lot of Chinese investment has gone into that market. Of course, the largest nickel mine is in Russia with Norilsk. Um, and um, lots of concerns about responsible mining of nickel, by the way. There's a, a lot of these mines that are dumping their mine tailings directly into the ocean. And so these efforts to clean up our air were polluting and fouling our waters at the same time. So there's, there's some concerns that are being voiced there, just to let you know. 
On lithium, lithium comes from areas where there's salt flats. What's interesting about lithium is you need water to harvest the lithium as part of the mining process. Well, in salt flats, there's a scarcity of water. What are we going to do for water sources? And so there's water wars that are developing, for example, in the high altitude, what they call the lithium triangle in Bolivia and Chile. And um, there's, you know, there's just not enough water. And so they're talking about the need for desalinization plants to pump water in just to extract the lithium. And then cobalt um, is over 70% of the production today comes from the Congo, about 50% of the global reserves. And just quite frankly, the, the Congo is a, is a bit of a train wreck. Um, geopolitically, um, you know, over 6 million dead in, um, in strife over the past three decades. So there's a lot of concerns there. Do you think that uh, the scarcity of these metals and their locations would cause geopolitical risks to spike in the future? Should demand for these metals continue to rise? Oh, and they are going to rise. And yes, I think they will. It will the prices on these metals will indeed climb. Um, this is going to be the the century of clean energy and mineral constraints like we've never experienced in our you know in our history. Uh, we're just going to simply hit some limits on the periodical table, and really be challenged to do more and more extraction to meet these clean energy demands. It's that simple. What are some of the uh, scientific solutions you've heard that are amongst your favorite in terms of extracting and finding a solution to this scarcity that scarcity problem that you've described? Well, so in particular on the PGMs, you know, South Africa, in fact, Kitco News, you've published articles uh, uh, of late where there's forums in South Africa. They're talking about how do we triple the PGM mining base in South Africa, since that's where the majority of the reserves are located. Uh, by the way, I, I don't think 3x is enough. I think we need more. Um, but that is actually the right discussion to be having. Um, unfortunately, the PGM metals, as you know, these are some of the most complex mines on the planet. On the western limb and the in the Bushfield complex, those mines are a mile, mile and a half deep in many cases. And um, there's a, a reluctance by in mining investors right now to invest, uh, especially with the duration from funding to actual production, often you know, 10 years or more in duration uh, for those PGM metals. And again, so I just think this is we're going to be in a stress state here. How do we get the impetus for investment and expand mining and all these different metals? and to mine them in a responsible fashion that's safe for the environment, safe for the oceans, safe for us all, that we can complete these transitions that we're talking about. So Matt, let's assume that the deficit of palladium and platinum will continue well into the future. What would happen to prices in that case? Uh, palladium, I think the deficits will continue for approximately five more years. Uh, I think the pricing getting to 2600 range is, is about where the zenith should be. Palladium will get into a surplus longer term as additional um, auto catalyst recycle continues to, to climb in its volume year over year. Um, on rhodium, I'm actually very concerned about rhodium. Rhodium already, you know, has set records this year uh, at over, you know, over thirteen and fourteen thousand dollars a troy ounce. Um, it's essential to Knox reduction and suppression in emission control catalysts. There, the design workarounds are still a ways off. And so I'm in particularly worried about rhodium being stressed even further. Um, platinum, I, I, you know, I, I, a climb of platinum back to its old highs in the mid 2000s, I, I think is very reasonable by 2030 to 35 timeframe. Um, lithium, cobalt, nickel, I could, I could see those metals being stressed and easily doubling over the course of the next decade, easily. Thank you very much, Matt. That was very educational. I appreciate your thoughts. Oh, it's my pleasure. You take care. Thank you. And thank you for watching Kickle News. We'll have more coverage at the IPMI conference. I'm David Lynn.